this episode of Skeptico. A show about UFOs and nukes. What do you see? Everybody get down! And who's talking and who isn't? Steve Longero, this airman who I did the next cognitive interview with, he'd been inside the nuclear weapons storage area when he'd seen a UFO shine a beam down into the nuclear bunkers. And it did like a grid-like search all the way down the hot row of the bunkers. When the UFO turned its beam off and then went out, it headed towards Reynolds from Forest. And he could hear people over the radio following it. And as soon as it went in the forest, then people, there was like an order given that we want as many security police into the forest because we don't know what we're dealing with. Now, one incredibly important little piece of information that has huge implications is during the course of my research, I spoke to three US Air Force security policemen who said that all of the, the main radio channels that the US Air Force security police used, they were you routinely recorded on audio tape. Now, that means there is no ambiguity there. There was all the evidence for all the nights. We wouldn't have to start piecing it together. But nobody talks about that. Colonel Holt certainly never talked about that. Colonel Williams certainly never talked about that. But three airmen, low, lower ranks, have said, yeah, it was routinely recorded. So where did all that information go? That first clip was from the movie Skyline and I don't know if they were trying to be campy or not, but when the Air Force shoots a nuclear missile into the UFO and the guy says, take cover under the couch, I thought that was a pretty fun way to lead into this whole topic of what information we're getting and the disinformation, misinformation, shaping of information, which in a lot of ways is the segue into today's interview because the second clip you heard was from Gary Heseltine, UFO researcher, extraordinary expert on the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident and former UK cop. So this is rich, rich, rich with information for people who are familiar with this case and highly relevant to uh, just everything, everything, everything that's going on and everything that's bigger than just what's going on right now. It's very important research, very important book, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore consciousness, science, and spirituality. Today, we welcome Gary Heseltine to Skeptico. Gary has just published what I think is a super important book. The book is titled Non-Human, The Rendlesham Forest UFO Incidents. That's incidents with an S. Gary is, uh, gosh, just a very, very top-notch UFO researcher, longtime detective in the police force in the UK, and really highly regarded in the UFO community for a long time as one of the leading experts on, of course, the Rendlesham Forest case, which this book is about. But I, I, I guess let's just start with Gary. Welcome. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I want to get back to why I think this book is so important. And I really want to make that the focus of this interview that kind of takes it in a slightly different direction because you do have this extensive, extensive background. Why don't you start by telling people a little bit about your pre UFO days, which I guess would be back a long time because you really had an encounter for a long time, but then you were kind of undercover for a while. And then you've been doing this, kind of right out front, you know, disclosure project, Washington, D.C., press club. You know, you were one of the people, Linda Moulton Howell. You know, you've been uh, on the front lines of this. But before all that, back to being a cop, as we call it here in the United States. OK, um, between 1983 and 1989, I served in the Royal Air Force as a police officer. And for three of my six years, I guarded uh, two nuclear weapons storage areas uh, that had tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and therefore, I have an affinity with the uh, U.S. Air Force Security Police who were involved in the Reynolds and Forest case because I basically did exactly the same job. Uh, in 1989, I left the RAF to join the British Transport Police, where I went on to have a 24-year career. The last 19 years, 
as a detective constable, not a high rank. I didn't want high rank. I didn't like the bureaucracy. I liked to be out there. Interviewing was my thing. I became an advanced interviewer of suspects and witnesses. I was also involved as a specialist interviewer in the London bombings of 2005, the four terrorist bombings. I was involved in investigating three of the uh, underground scenes uh, of first responding transport police officers that went to the scene. So that was incredibly interesting. Hey, Gary, let, let me, you well, know, I picked up a little tidbit listening to uh, one of the interviews that I thought was just fascinating. So one that, you know, you didn't want to make the move because you felt you were very good at your job. And I also get the sense that you felt your job was very important. I get the sense that you are kind of a high responsibility person. You take public safety responsible, protect and serve, I think is kind of in your blood. I get the sense. And then, yeah. and, this, and then uh, with this regard uh, interrogation or interviewing, I, I thought it was fascinating. I, I prefer I prefer the term interviewing rather than interrogation. That's an entirely different thing, and I'm not trained to interrogate. Although you you did get some solicitors saying it was like an interrogation uh, when you had people on the ropes, as it were, and they were given admissions. So, so yes, uh, my my specialist thing was interviewing. I liked the psychology of this. You talk, I talk, and trying to figure it out. Uh, so that was really my specialist thing. Uh, I didn't want to go higher because the the higher you went, w effectively meant that you weren't a police officer anymore. You became an administrative manager, and you were stuck behind a computer, and you actually never did or rarely ever did police work again. Uh, so the advanced interviewing that I did uh, was effectively for murder, manslaughter, rape, uh, and so that was what attracted me. I liked the psychology of interviewing both suspects and trying to obtain fresh new evidence from witnesses uh, using psychological techniques to try to recover memories. Not hypnosis, I might add, but there are techniques out there to try to recover memories, which could obviously be very useful uh, in trying to solve a case. Fantastic. That's exactly where I wanted to go. Because in one of those interviews, you kind of revealed one of those. And it sounds really basic, but I, I could tell by the way you were talking about it, that it was super effective. And you used it in your police work. And now I think you definitely used it in this important book, Non-Human. Tell us about that and particularly not interrupting people and letting them talk. Yeah. Uh, and it's a strange uh, thing to do at first. Uh, because it's not the natural way of conversation. The natural interaction between humans is I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk. But when you come to trying to uh, retrieve memories of uh, a profound, significant incident, what you want to do is not interrupt the train of thought by the witness who is concentrating hard. So cutting a long story short, it's called the enhanced cognitive method. And, and basically it's designed to be used within days, hours after a significant event to try to retrieve as much memory as possible. Now, you're right. Uh, I, I thought I would try it with a couple of witnesses uh, in the book, important military, US Air Force military witnesses, and it worked uh, particularly well on two interviews with a guy called Sergeant Adrian Bustinza and another another one called Airman Steve Longero. Uh, Airman Steve Longero was a three and a half hour transatlantic phone call, almost uh, forty two years after forty years after the event. That is not what it's supposed to do, but you can incorporate elements of it. And with Adrian Bustinza, that was like uh, 41 years after the event. Uh, and that was a four and a half hour transatlantic phone call. So you can't hypnotize people. But what you can do uh, is to try to set up the interview in, in the best way. And there is a technique for that. And cutting a long story short is that once you've developed that rapport stage, made them feel comfortable, you've explained the procedure that you're going to try to do, you then effectively say, look, I'm now going to hand the interview over to you and you just tell me whatever you want to say in whatever order you want to say it and I am not going to interrupt you. And it's called the first account. And 
the first account goes against your basic method of interaction because you want to cut in and say, uh, you said you said red. Was it a red car? Uh, 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 what was it? You know, you want to naturally do that. But in this first interview with something that's really profound, the last thing you want to do is interrupt the witness's train of thought. So you set them up and then you say, look, I all I'm going to do is just nod my head. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that's called Googling. And that just encourages and it passes the ball back to the interviewee without me interrupting their train of thought. And what you want them to do is you've set it up and said, look, whether you want to look at the wall, look down at your feet, close your eyes, whatever works best for you. But I want you to concentrate on trying to retrieve memories of what this incident was. And once you'd handed it over, you then did that. And amazingly, in those two highly significant interviews, they did that. They captured and they were able to retrieve more information than that would that ever done before. And and there is a particular uh, uh, aspect of the interview that I did with Sergeant Adrian Bustinza, which I think is arguably the most powerful part of the book, where he has been interrogated uh, in an underground facility. Uh, which is believed to be on area pent waters. He has got either side of him two big, kind of like mafioso kind of figures, but they're not. They're Air Force officers of special investigation. He's told to sit down. He's put in a darkened room. There's a screen, and there's somebody behind the screen, but he can't see who they are. But that somebody from the other side of the screen is talking to him. And he has been threatened with his life because he has uh, inadvertently found himself a witness to something he really shouldn't have seen. And they are threatening him with his life. And there's a page of testimony which is so palpable. Uh, I, I, For me, it's probably the highlight section of the book. Uh, and it, there's literally one page where it's just all free text and there's no interruption. And he is talking about that interrogation. And the key thing that comes across is the palpable fear, the anxiety. He was being threatened with his life. His, his father worked for the government. His family were being surveilled in the United States. And uh, his wife, his mum was worried for her, her husband's job. Um, he was told bullets are cheap. And, and he, he was just a young man uh, in his early 20s, a sergeant. And he was thinking, I've joined the US Air Force to protect my country. And I am now being made to feel like I'm a criminal. I'm being threatened with my life, which really disgusted him. And he and he came out of that basically saying, I was so disgusted at the, my treatment that I wanted to go AWOL, absent without leave, desert, in, a, in other words. Now, that's a really powerful piece of testimony. And if you've read that, I think anybody will go, wow. Because when I read it back uh, in the proofing stage, I do, when I proof, I, I, I can read it like a, a narrator or an actor and give it some emphasis. And when I read it back, I thought, Jesus, this is really powerful stuff. And that just shows you one of the lesser known elements of the Rendlesham Forest case, where uh, uh, four or five people that we know of, witnesses, military witnesses, were subjected to, to very harsh uh, interrogation, which I can only think is illegal. Uh, but there you go. That's part of the Rendlesham story, which not many people talk about, but very powerful testimony. And so in those two interviews, uh, Adrian Bustinza and Steve Longero, uh, they were able to retrieve lots of new information. Between them, uh, two sightings, Steve Longero knew, and two, uh, well, one entirely new event uh, for Adrian Bustinza, and the clarification of a second landing later on in uh, towards the end of the interview uh, on another night, which is this controversial one uh, of a second landing where the base commander of 12,000 people, that it was being filmed on motion picture footage, which for anybody over a certain age means moving images, video to all intents and purposes, uh, that it was being filmed. 
that it was a, a second craft was on the ground in a field, was surrounded by US Air Force security police officers. Very, very controversial because the original military whistleblower was a guy called Larry Warren. Young kid, again, 19 years old, first tour, literally only being on the base, matter of weeks, and he gets caught up into it. Now, he came out with this story in late 1982, and people went, wow, you know, but, you know, how serious, have we got any corroboration? And in effect, there wasn't corroboration enough. <clears throat> but with this interview, it finally put that to bed, because l later on in the interview, Adrian Bastinza says, Oh, Larry Warren, he said, yeah, he was in, I don't know why they picked him, but they were, he was closer to the craft than I was. So you're confirming that Larry Warren was there? Yes, and he was closer to the craft than you? Yes. That there was U US Air Force security police officers all around you? Yes. That it was being filmed, a motion picture footage? Yes. And that Colonel Williams, the base commander of 12,000 people, was present. Yes. Now, Larry Warren had taken that a slight stage further originally in late 1982 by saying that when he was part of the cordon, three, uh, what can only be described as entities of some description, some life forms, were uh, didn't come from a doorway, effectively slipped off the fabric of the craft, which is described about 30 feet across, shimmering, you couldn't look at it straight on because it would distort, but uh, like a bubble slipped off the fabric of the craft and the single bubble then divided into three bubbles and within each of the bubbles was effectively the upper torso of what can only be described as a childlike small entity. And there was some kind of silent face-off with the base commander of 12,000 personnel. So this is a big deal. It was being filmed. And you've now got Adrian Mustinder saying, yeah, that happened. But the thing that surprised me, he said, but that happened on a different night. I said, what do you mean? And he said it happened on a different night because the existing story is that this had happened on what was called the third night, popularly known as the Holt Night. I said, not the Holt Night. He said, no, I was involved in another incident. Now, it might not be the actual next night, but it probably is given all the other circumstances. But the key thing, what he was saying is that Adrian Bustinza, Sergeant Adrian Bustinza, was being involved in another incident on another night. So a second night of involvement for him. This we didn't know about. So again, absolutely fresh. We call it fresh snow when you retrieve new information that's been locked up, locked away in your memory. And then suddenly they were able to recall it. And that was a significant clarification. But this puts it to bed. And effectively, what was supposed to happen was that the base commander was in a silent, non-verbal communication with one or three of these entities. Basically, they, were, they, they may be less than 10 feet apart. These three entities are floating off the ground, and there's the base commander. So there's uh, plus the security cordon around it, all being filmed. Now, what an incredible thing if that happened. Well, Sergeant Adrian Bastins is saying that happened because I was there. But he also said that Colonel Holt was there, or Lieutenant Colonel Holt, the deputy base commander, who we've become well aware of uh, for many years in documentaries. But effectively, he has denied that there was ever a second landing since he retired. Now, if you've read the book, you'll realize that he actually made a significant admission to my eyes as a former detective that would stand up in a court of law in 1985 six years before he retired and then became this public personality that you now see in all the documentaries. So I can talk about that if you want, but that was a brilliant admission in 1985 that confirmed that that incident in the field happened uh, way before he retired. So I think that's highly relevant. How's that? <laughs> you know, before we started like rolling, I told you that I was scrambling with where to go. And uh, you just kind of laid out probably 10 or 15 topics that I want to talk on. And we could talk for an hour. I mean, one right off the bat, I, I think the, uh, the method that you used here is particularly important. And I'm really glad that you explained it so people can, because everyone's trying to figure out who's real, who's legit and who's telling right. a good story, uh, the right story, who's really who's really delivering the goods. I think yeah. you give us some reasons 
to suspect that you really are delivering the goods. Staying up all night over there in the UK to do four-hour phone calls transatlantic. I was shattered in the morning because one of the things that people don't realize is that if you're an interviewer, and you'll know about this in your capacity as a podcaster, radio show, is that when you're thinking of the questions to ask your interviewee, that is mentally tiring. And plus, you've got all your equipment to work. You've got timings to consider. It's difficult. So imagine being a, you've been up all day and then you finally get to speak to the guy you've been after for several years. You finally get to speak to him. He comes in from work and I immediately say, you know, you know, you've just come in from work. Do you want me to call back? Do you want to ever get something to eat? And he basically said, no, let's do it now. Little did I suspect that it would then go on for four and a half hours. So with the transatlantic time difference, this kind of finished at like six in the morning for me. And I have mentally been going for four and a half hours and I'm exhausted. Uh, but I would say that it was the most important UFO in, uh, interview I've ever done. And arguably the most important thing I've ever done uh, in my life in terms of uh, non-family things because of the significance of his role as a witness and and adrian mustinsery is has got the longest chapter in the book because he had made a number of pronouncements over the years but he was heavily affected by his interrogation he was a religious person family man and he suffered nightmares post-trauma but he also uh, and it's not, I don't really touch on it too much, is that he suffered a medical injury uh, as a result of another incident that he was involved in with, with a, another witness called John Burroughs. This, okay. this is during the Rendlesham Forest events, over those few days. John Burroughs was with Jim Penniston on what was called the first night landing of a small triangular craft on the night of Christmas night into Boxing Day. That's classed as the first night. Nobody really disputes that. That's the first night. Uh, but a couple of nights later on what was called the third night, the Holt night, where he does the mem the, the, the uh, memorandum about his involvement and also produces an audio tape, which we can talk about because that's interesting. But uh, basically, John Burroughs had, had come back when he'd heard the other incidents. He lived off base in Ipswich, a town about 11 miles away, and he'd managed to get a lift back to the base because he got wind, I don't know how, but he got wind that another UFO incident was developing at night. So he gets back there, and eventually, after uh, Lieutenant Colonel Holt's small team comes back after being out on patrol for four and a half hours and witnessing multiple UFOs, they come back to what's called the staging area. Staging area is a significant place because it was where all the vehicles were. They couldn't go any further into the forest, so it's where all the vehicles stopped. It became like a parking area, and lots of personnel were kept there in case they were needed. Now, John Burroughs uh, waited for Holt's team to come back, and when they did, and, I'm, and this is a key thing, Sergeant Adrian Bustinza was a part of Holt's team, so this is a significant involvement. The guy who was later interrogated and saw this other incident. So they come back to the staging area, and John Burroughs is there, and he says, can I go back out there? And Colonel Hollett is reluctant to let him go, but he says, okay. And for some reason, he asks Sergeant Adrian Bustinza to go out with him back into the forest. And he's only literally just come back after being out for four and a half hours. But he says, I'll come out for you for a short time. And off they go, and no sooner, a few, literally, I think no more than five, ten minutes later, and they're not quite in the field, uh, I think close to the field. The exact position has never been truly identified, but it's near to the field, uh, and there's woods all the way near to it, the forest. Adrian Mustinza says that he feels a force on the back of his legs, as if somebody's kicked his back of his legs, and, and which causes him to fall forward onto his knees and put his hands out. As, as that happens, he sprawled out a light of uh, maybe 20 metres, uh, 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 John is about 20 metres in front of him, a light suddenly engulfs John Burroughs. Absolutely an intense bright white light engulfs him. And as it does so, part of the beam of the light strikes Adrian Bustins across his hands and part of his groin. Right. And amazingly, he then developed a rash, which he still has to this day, in the position that happened, and as uh, is growing as well, it's non-life threatening, but it's been there, and he attributes it directly to that event. 
but the event that he saw looking forward is John Burroughs, who was about six foot six, he's a giant, uh, is that he's engulfed in this bright light. It's so intense, all he can see is like a small figure, entity, whatever you want to call it, on the left side of John, John in the middle, and another figure, smaller, on the right side. And then the light goes out. They go back. Uh, and this is an interesting thing as well, because we talk about missing time and abductions and whatever. Now, when they left from Adrian Bastinza and John Burroughs' point of view, they were only gone for about 10 minutes. But when they got back to the staging area, Colonel Holt, well, Lieutenant Colonel Holt at the time, he was angry with them. Where have you been? What have you been doing? And he kind of said that they'd been gone for 40 minutes. But according to John and... Adrian, about 10 minutes. So you have this time, missing time experience. And, and of course, with what we what we now know of the subject, I think it's entirely feasible that during that uh, missing 20, 30-minute period that something happened to John and perhaps Adrian Bustinza. Adrian Bustinza uh, has never undergone any hypnosis. Uh, John Burroughs has, and he uh, recalls stuff under hypnosis. I'm not a big fan of the hypnosis because, yes, you can get some interesting anecdotal information, but evidentially it's not really worth the paper it's written on because you can't really, you've altered the mind status. You, you, It's not under free recall. So I would say that it has a question mark about what comes out. I'm not saying it doesn't reveal information. It probably does, but in terms of evidence, I wouldn't hold it that strong. Gary, it's interesting that you said a couple of times, this puts it to bed. And I know completely what you mean, but I think you're speaking now from someone who has been, I guess, just intensely involved in this case and in this field for a long time. And you've lived through these controversies and I'd like to play you a video clip. And then I want you to recount how the, how the whole, I don't want to say narrative, how this how this case has evolved in terms of public opinion, in terms of uh, dissenters, skeptical people who are some of them seem to be genuinely skeptical. Some of them seem to be have an agenda driven, skeptical nature to it. Let me play this video, maybe a couple of videos, and then you, you can tell me tell me what it's about. My name is Gary Azeltine, and I am a recently retired police detective in England, having served almost 24 years with the British Transport Police. For the majority of that time, for 20 years, I was a detective. I was dealing at the sharp end of evidence, evidential matters, I've been being involved in murder, manslaughter, rape, etc., etc. I come to this subject on an evidential basis, and I think that is very necessary in this field. I am here principally to speak on behalf of police officers worldwide who have witnessed UFOs. But I would also like to say that I'm also one of the principal investigators of the Rendlesham Forest incident that my colleague Peter has alluded to, along with Linda Moulton Howe, I would consider as the three principal investigators of this incident. We're all doing very good work on it. For the last five years, I have worked with Colonel Charles Holt, the man who wrote the Holt Memorandum, the deputy base commander of what was absolutely a nuclear facility. And let me back that up by saying that for three years of my six years in the Royal Air Force, between 1983 and 1989, I served on two nuclear bases doing exactly the same job as what those US Air Force policemen did. And the base at Bentwaters is identical to the base that Arif Labrock in West Germany where I worked. Let's cut the crap. This is a nuclear issue. Okay. I wanted, I thought you'd get a kick. I, I dug that up and I said, I, I got to play it for this guy to look back. Let's go back in the time capsule. Tell us what we just watched and tell us a little bit about what's going on at that time versus what's going on in this time. Because again, I want to frame up this book, Non-Human, and what this book means in a post-disclosure world that we live in because the clip we showed was definitely pre-disclosure and it has a different tone to it, a different ring to it. There's so many things I know you could speak to on that. Just jump in wherever you want. 
Well, the video, that clip that you showed was uh, myself giving testimony at what was called the Citizens' Hearings uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, in late April, early May of 2013. Uh, in effect, it was a mock congressional hearing, uh, and we gave testimony to approximately 40 witnesses, stroke researchers, uh, who gave testimony for five days, over five days, Monday to Friday, um, at the National Press Club, which is very close to the White House, a very prestigious place. And uh, we gave testimony before one former senator and five former congressmen and women. So a panel of six uh, people who, I think, who had collectively 80 plus years of public office amongst them. So a very uh, esteemed people. And in fact, the Senator Mike Gravel, I think, had at one time been a presidential candidate. So that, you know, that's how kind of uh, important he was. And uh, I was giving testimony uh, principally about my work with police officers. What we haven't touched upon for your listeners is that how I became known within the UFO field was whilst I was still a serving detective uh, in 2000, uh, January 2002, I went public with the launch of a police database and an unofficial national police database for UK police officers called Proofos, Police Reporting UFOs. And as a result, that uh, attracted a fair bit of media attention, TV, radio, newspapers, etc. And that's how I became known. And one thing that I didn't anticipate, the spin-off from that, and I'll come back to where we're going with this, is that uh, UFO groups in the UK started to say, well, you give us lectures about your police cases because I, I was by creating the database I was basically encouraging serving and retired UK police officers to report sightings to me and I would create a database plus I would also collect any historical sightings that were found in books magazines etc uh, and police officers did start to come forward so I began to ask to do lectures and and as a result of that over time I was then uh, becoming more well-known media-wise, and uh, I was invited by Steve Bassett to be one of the witnesses at the citizens hearing. Uh, just before that, three months before, completely out of the blue, and, and, and I was flabbergasted. I'm not very often lost for words, but I was when, again, at the National Press Club, he'd invited me for what was an EXO conference uh, in 2010, and then suddenly on the... Uh, on the Saturday night at the like the evening gala event, uh, he presented me with the Disclosure Award, the PRG Disclosure, effectively within UFO terms, the World Disclosure Award. Some very eminent people have won that. Uh, and I got that. And it was on the strength of that that I then was elevated and asked to do a lot of international lectures. And I've now lectured in 21, 22 countries, I think, at the moment. And so that's how I my involvement was a significant and I think it's because of that that then when the citizens hearings came about Steve Bassett asked me to talk initially uh, just about police officers I shouldn't have really talked about Rendlesham at all but what I would have to say is that and this is coming back to the framing of your question uh, in 2013 uh, I was still in a close a working collaborative relationship with former retired uh, base commander, deputy base commander Charles Holt, Colonel Charles Holt. I'd met him in uh, December of 2007 for uh, when we both appeared in an episode of UFO Hunters with Bill Burns. It was a TV series that ran on, I think, the History Channel for three seasons. And anyway, it was in the first series. And that's how I'd met him. And we, we got on well. And I at the end of that shoot, I basically said, well, you know, will you collaborate with me? I, I, I kind of do amateur screenplay writing for films. Uh, I've always loved the cinema. Uh, and I, I've always considered that at some point in the future, there will be a major... Hollywood film about Randerson Forest. The problem is that the, uh, in t from Hollywood's point of view, and I've talked to producers, the, the problem is there isn't a Harrison Ford uh, heroic figure for them. And we're talking multiple nights, hundreds of people, basically, a lot of moving parts. Uh, and, and Hollywood tends to like a hero. Uh, 
there are some heroes, but nobody who encompasses the whole event. Um, so anyway, we'd struck up this rapport. So this was in a good period. So I had a seven-year collaboration period between late 2007 through to about late 2014. Uh, we can talk about why I ended that relationship later on. Talk about talk about why you ended it. I think that brings it full circle before we go on too much, because it's important and it fits into, I think, back to this question of who do we Narrative. trust? What is disclosure? You know, even the people who are trying to be good guys, trying to be, I think he's trying to be the Harrison Ford character. And then he's certainly stepping forward and saying, I am the Harrison Ford character. But then we find out in your book that he's not exactly the Harrison Ford character and he's playing a role that he has to play, which a lot of these guys in it are doing. What's so fascinating about the book is you talk to people who we look at and we go, holy shit, this guy isn't playing the game. This guy is just really telling us the truth. And that contrast is what really makes the book so phenomenal. Well, I, I, I think the primary focus of the book was to tell the truth in a way to the people that it's never been told before, to analyse everything that had gone on in the last four to two years since the incident, present it in an evaluated way. So you examine it, you look at the transcripts of old interviews, you take away the key parts and you, you think, you know, you know, what's he trying to say? Uh, and I, I applied myself as a former detective to kind of do a, like a cold case review. And, and a lot of people, a lot of researchers who I've sent it to have said, it's like no other UFO book because it's analytical in terms of dissecting interviews, the key parts, etc., cetera, uh, and drawing uh, obvious conclusions. You can make reasoned conclusions. Uh, and so that's what I did. And I took all the sentiment out, because I know a lot of these people had had kind of relationships, working relationships. I knew them well, uh, not so well in some cases, but I took all the personality out of it and really wanted to concentrate on the facts. And in fact, I start off with a, a, a great quote at the beginning by Trey Gowdy, a former uh, Republican uh, congressman who basically said, the facts are the facts. You know, I, I'm not a Democrat, not Republican, the facts are the facts. And that was my mantra, basically, to, to take away personality and just examine the facts, evaluate the key parts, and then put them forward as a reasoned conclusion which is what I've done throughout the book. And a lot of people seem, uh, I've had incredible reviews by researchers uh, across the board saying that it's not like anything else. And, and, and the foreword of the book is written by Don Smith, which is really good for me. Not only is he a friend because he's part of ISA, the International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research, of which I'm the vice president and he's the North American uh, director, uh, Don uh, is eminent and arguably, uh, in most people's eyes, the leading expert on Roswell. Well, most people will say that Roswell is like arguably the most important UFO case in history because of its uh, historical significance and allegedly what was recovered as a craft and bodies. I would, uh, a lot of people would say that Rendlesham Forest because of its complex nature, multiple nights of activity. And we can talk about the conclusions of the book later on, where I break it down, the timeline uh, that, that I was able to break down, the number of incidents that people were involved in. But when you look at the Rendlesham Forest incident, it's many people regard it as the second most famous no, no, case. No, no, no. It's clearly, after this book, after Non-Human, it's clearly the most important UFO case, because it, we don't have any information. Take your book and compare it with everything we have on Roswell. And we're already 10 steps ahead in terms of multiple trusted eyewitnesses, multiple incidents, multiple uh, sources for those uh, and new sources still emerging that have a different spin on it, too. So let me pull you back to to Hulk, but okay. before we get too far, too far down the road. OK, right. OK, so the primary reason for uh, doing the book was to try to change the existing narrative of the case. I found um, in, during an evolving period of my time with Colonel Holt, so literally from when I became publicly involved in research, which was December 2007 when I first met Holt, 
then I had that seven year collaboration period and I've been doing research. I then have done a deep dive back into the case to write the book. The book took three years to write, five years of reinvestigation. And I found lots of old historical interviews that I was not even aware of. I found an, an incredible admission that I was not aware of. Uh, and I'm pretty certain that 80% of the people who read this book will not have a clue about the level of content that's in it because I'm revealing stuff that's never been presented uniformly to the public in one go. There are lots of books on the UFOs. There are lots of books on Reynolds and Forest, but none have really, I think, delved into it in, an, uh, in a, uh, a logical, analytical way. They've had their own bias towards it. Some are written by witnesses themselves, blah, blah, blah. But I kind of use my detective skills to try to do an update. The best book in many ways prior uh, to Non-Human uh, is the book by Georgina Brunei that came out in two, the year 2000, You Can't Tell the People. Uh, she wasn't a UFO person at all. Uh, she was a kind of like a, a celebrity uh, writer. But she got involved and she did, a, I think, an excellent job in tracking down witnesses. And it's a pretty good guide of where we were in 2000 and summarising the whole case. But here we are now, 42 years after the event, and what have we got? We've got a plethora of books, but none that really look at it in a whole, in an overall uh, review. And so that's what I tried to do. And one of the reasons why I tried to do it, uh, and you'll notice, well, you might not be aware of this, but there was no pre-publicity for my book on Amazon whatsoever. Now, that's not a coincidence. I deliberately did that. And the reason why I deliberately did that is because I know for a fact that some people did not want this book to come out. Yeah. And had I have flagged it up and said, oh, it's going to be out on the 10th of August, I may well have been challenged legally or whatever, or attempts at challenging me. I didn't want that. And I thought, I want to get the truth out there. So when it was done, when it was uh, proofed, it went out and it went out under the radar. And then I began the publicity. By then, I'd already given uh, copies to researchers, got their feedback. And, um, um, and I was very humbled by the feedback, especially Don Smith who wrote the forward, given his prominence with Roswell and the, the link between the two cases in historical significance uh, kind of ratings. Uh, and I was amazed at the, the response that I got from researchers uh, and delighted, obviously. Uh, but it went out under the radar deliberately, and then I started the publicity. Now, I'm at the stage now where I am looking for a mainstream big publisher because on Amazon, well, I can go around all the world on Amazon, but it you don't have the same distribution. You don't have the same uh, promotion uh, facility as a big publisher now. But now... I think I can go back with all the reviews that I've got from researchers and say, look, you could have a, a bestseller here. And it's not because I want to be this major bestseller, although people will say, of course it does. But no, my only primary thing was I wanted the feedback from my peer group, my re research peer group, and that has been uniformly brilliant. So I, I, I'm humbled by their kind words. But I think that I am limited in how I can expose this book to what should be hundreds of thousands. Only I, people who are really interested in the subject will know the Rendlesham case, and only those at the very, you know, that's a small percentage, although millions of people are interested in the subject, very few actually get books, and of those that do, you need to have a real name behind you. Now, I'm well known in the UK, and I've done lots of international lectures. I gave testimony at the citizens hearings in june 2022 i gave testimony uh before the brazilian senate yeah i read that if you've seen that and, and that's a really powerful speech that was didn't come out quite the way i wanted it uh because i didn't in, intend to be as passionate as i was but i was so passionate and i saw some of the faces of the politicians and i thought no i'm going to hit you with the evidence here and so i really kind of went after them and gave them the truth about the subject but in terms of the book the book wants to try to change the narrative because for the last 25 years 
basically four people have controlled every documentary that's ever been made. Lieutenant Colonel Holt, uh, Jim, Sergeant Jim Pennison, and Eamon John Burroughs. And one other person, Nick Pope, who was the former MOD guy. Now, you'll see in the book that there's a chapter on Nick Pope, but he has had a very, very uh, important role or link to the case that I think is detrimental to the case. And all of these people I've met, multiple occasions, and the narrative as it stands now is wrong because they con they attack other witnesses that come forward, and that should not be the reaction of uh, people who are genuinely involved in an event it, that is pretty unique. So what Colonel Holt should have done... Well, Holt, the... so, so before you back up a little bit on, on Holt, what? okay, because he's super important, as you say, in he this is. story, and if we're going to try it... If we're going to try and fit him in, uh, because you said like, you know, every, not everyone, but so many people have heard the the recording, which was the big juicy thing 10 years ago. Oh, my God, the colonel's out in the in the forest and yeah. he's actually doing a recording. That's what sticks in everyone's head. And yep. he, he forms the memorandum. Support, yeah. the memorandum. And but what you reveal here is in this book, which I had he knows never more. Heard, he knows more. He, he knows more. He did. He was playing some kind of misinformation, disinformation yes. game, not only with the general public, but even with you and no doubt with other yeah. researchers. So what did you think back back to our clip? What did you think back then? And what did you think? How did that evolve? And where does that put you in this spectrum of who do you trust? Misinformation, disinformation, no information. Because, you know, you have a military background. You understand that there are secrets that have to be maintained. But yeah. I think we both understand that there's a difference when it becomes misinformation and disinformation and intentional deceit and intentional manipulation, not even getting into some of the more, even more immoral stuff. So take us down that path for a minute with Holt as being, you know, the figure for, for driving us through that narrative. Well, when I when I first met uh, Colonel Holt uh, on the very first night that we met uh, in December of 2007 for this film shoot, we we kind of both found ourselves in the reception area of the hotel where we were staying for the filming, and the film crew were out. It was probably after six at night, and he didn't recognise me because he'd never met me, but I obviously recognised him. So I approached him and said, look, you know, uh, I'm a former RAF police officer. I've, I've been involved, invited to take part. And anyway, we got on like a house on fire, and we sat down, and we, had, uh, we weren't required for filming that night. So we sat in the pub that was part of the hotel, and we had a meal, and we chatted famously. And, and, and at the end of that, I'd said, will you work on a, a screenplay that I'm writing? And he said, yes. So that's how the collaboration began. But he said on that first night, he told me there were more nuclear weapons at RAF Bentwater than anywhere else in Europe. He told me that. And then since denied it. Now, I can't prove it. But that's what he said. I actually did write it down in a book uh, after that, uh, which I can produce, where I wrote some things about, because I was excited to meet him. He's a colonel. You know, he's a big, famous guy. So I was kind of not in awe of him, but I was, I was certainly very pleased to meet him and whatever. And we got on really well. And anyway, that collaboration period, and, and it had begun on the basis of, collaboration for a film script i was going to write it i was going to send him it as updates and he would give me advice on trying to make it more authentic and whatever and he loved the scripts as they went along now i'd said at the start you know tell me everything and he said he would now i had no reason at that time in 2007 and early 2008 uh to think that he was lying all right however things progressed so one of the things that stands out is that after I said from the start, I'm going to go away for four months, research everything that I could. This is too, late 2007, and then I'm going to come back to early 2008, and I'm going to start asking you questions. And he went, yeah, fine. So I went back, did that. Four months later, I started asking him questions. And I said to him, uh, who's who's the fifth person in your group? And he went, oh, I'm not, I'm not quite sure of the name. And... And he could reel off uh, Munro Neville, Sergeant Ball, Lieutenant England himself. Who was the fifth person? Mm, I can't remember. And I said to him, 
it's Sergeant Adrian Bastinger. He's actually on the audio tape. Oh, yes, yes. You know, it was kind of like that. And I thought, oh, that's a bit odd. Uh, anyway, that was an inkling, perhaps. Down the line, it was clear that Colonel Holt uh, was definitely involved. He did write the Holt Memorandum. He was a witness to what was regard to the third night events. And he was aware of lots of things on and around. Now, as the relationship went on, it was clear to me, or it began to become clear to me, that he, he probably knew a lot more. And he was being a bit inconsistent. And he particularly had a downer on um, Larry Warren, the original military whistleblower. Now, and which I could never quite understand, other than being the fact that it was as a result of him that the memorandum came out. And he then got a became this public figure. And he had tried, he told me, uh, he's quite open about it, he tr he tried to get it pulled when he knew it was coming out because he knew his life would be, never be the same. And I actually said, on the first night I met him, I said, when you die, I said, you've had a fantastic military career, but you'll not be remembered for your military career. You'll be remembered for being the deputy base commander at Reynoldsville Forest. And he, he looked at me and I said, yeah, but that's the reality. Is It's such a famous case. That's what you'll be remembered for. So anyway... It comes to uh, 2014, and by then, I, I was becoming increasingly concerned about where he was going with some of the things that he was saying about people. Can I can uh, I interject a question here? Because I'm really curious. Well, because you have that you have that military background, and I'm sure you in police work in the military, you rub shoulders with the intelligence folks enough to know how that thing is played. Where do you suspect he is at in 2008 in terms of them saying, hey, pal, this is the narrative. This is the line. Don't cross over it. And for God's sake, don't wind up in a pub, have a couple too many drinks and tell people about. And then so where is the line? And then how does that work? How much are they manipulating, pushing? What do you think? You know, you've been there. You know how it works. Well, I. I... What I what I what I consider is that Colonel Holt knows a lot more. Uh, I believe that he was involved in at least one more NATO activity, which is the admission that he made to research a MUFON researcher in 1985, uh, which we can talk about in a bit because it's it's super important uh, because it was made before he retired. So there's and it was written and, and his reply to a, to a question over the phone was written down verbatim. Which which is key, you know, it's unambiguous. It's a it's a verbatim quote. Uh, but the key thing is that uh, uh, Colonel Holt is an interesting figure because a lot of people have said, well, he never got interrogated, and why not? Well, I guess that's maybe because of his high rank. But a lot, he would say to people that he'd never been uh, quizzed particularly about uh, after the incident, which don't kind of make sense to most people. Uh, and and I kind of figured out whilst writing the book, what the answer is. And the answer is down to Gordon Williams, the base commander at the time. Now, base commander Gordon Williams, the guy who had this supposed meeting with the entities in the field, which is key to the whole story, uh, and Adrian Bastinza, Sergeant Adrian Bastinza. James Fox, the noted filmmaker, um, Capt uh, I think it was for his documentary, I Know What You Saw. And, uh, and, and anyway, he tracked down Colonel Williams uh, with a, 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 a golf resort, I think. Uh, and anyway, Colonel Williams is retired and he's, he's lent on the side of his car. Uh, and, he, and he just interviews him. Uh, and, and Colonel Williams' attitude was, mm, when the memorandum came out, the whole memorandum, uh, that should have never have come out, but it did, and it went away, and it had a life of its own. And he basically said, you couldn't put Humpty back together again. Uh, and what he meant by that, and I, I watched the clip over and over at times, and over the time of writing the book, I began to realise its significance. Because what he was basically saying is, okay, for three years we denied everything, and then you found the memo. We could not deny it anymore. It was on the letter-headed U.S. Air Force note paper, and it's a, it's a genuine U.S. Air Force document. So we can't deny it. We can't deny the contents, which is two nights of UFO activity. But we can deny everything else. <laughs> but anything else, 
we will deny. And that's exactly where Colonel Holt is. I think his role was, you can say, now the memo's out, you can talk around about your involvement on the night and walk around that. You can talk about John and Jim's first night. You can talk about that because it's in the memo. But do not, under any circumstances, talk about little green men, floating entities, another landing, and anything else. Again, Which kind Gary, of makes Gary, sense. Gary it, to, and that speaks again to folks the significance of the book, right? So putting that into context. There isn't this another is, book that takes this the is, story and yes. gives you the truth. So, so th that explains how we were fed, what we were fed, and why we were fed it. And But it is still the base of understanding because we operated under that kind of illusion for a long time. So now we can use that as the base, and then we can take non-human and say, hey, but they were filming it. But hang on. Let, 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 let me just put in there, because this is important what you're saying. Because what that does is it affects the narrative. And the people that controlled the narrative were Holt, Penniston and Burroughs and Nick Pope. So every TV producer went to them and says, oh, look, we want to make a documentary about Rendlesham. Who do you want in the programme? Well, they decided who the guests would be. Now, if this was any other subject, a political programme or an expose, they, they wouldn't get a look in, but they were given effectively who they wanted. So they have controlled the way the case has been portrayed. So no other really witness testimony ever emerges in these documentaries. And when new document, new testimony does arrive, like Adrian Bustinzis, it gets attacked. Like Steve Longero, the first response from Colonel Holt was, oh, it's just a Larry Warren's drinking pal. He's just got him out. He's one of his drinking drug pals. And, and that's not the way it should be. It should be, I always felt that Holt should have been the one as a senior person involved to go on the record to say, look, however big or small your part is, let's all come together as a group and let's try to work as one to find out what really happened. But he never did that. And people couldn't really understand that. But now when you look at it with the, the clip, of uh, what Colonel Williams says. Now, Colonel Williams has said, no, nah, I never was in that field. No, talk of aliens, rubbish. Holt has said, no, I was never in that field. And that's why when I did the deep dive and then I came across this admission that he made six years before he retired, so talk about that. Did. Talk about the specifics of that, because you have the evidence in the book. You have reproduced. Absolutely, it's all it's all there. And and there's there's what well, there's three types of evidence that happens in all Western world evidence for court, which is oral testimony, written documents, which is called documentary evidence, and anything that's physical. If I if I pick up this microphone, that's something physical you can hold in your hand, and you can produce that as an exhibit. That's called real evidence. But what it means is it's something physical. So on all the basis of all cases that go to court in the US, the UK, around the Western world, that's how evidence is done. Oral testimony is then turned into written testimony that becomes a written statement. Yeah, but it starts off as oral testimony. So those three are the basis of everything. Now, it's exactly the same with UFOs. You're going to have witnesses. You're going to have written information. You're going to have maybe physical objects, videotape, audio tape in the case of the Holt Memorandum. If you think of the uh, the Holt Memorandum as a document, that's a unique piece of documentary evidence, written evidence. That's arguably one of the top five, ten documents in UFO history. So what we have is this evidential aspect that most people don't realize they just think what evidence there isn't any evidence of UFOs it's all rubbish because that's the way it's being portrayed but there is a lot of evidence that you can gather and a lot of the evidence comes in the form of old interviews in little known UFO journals and so I tried to do that now when I did the deep dive I talked to a guy called Ray Boucher now this guy for me is an absolute hero and yet I guarantee you 99% of the people in Rendleton and the UFO world have never heard of him. Why? Because people haven't really given him and his colleague, Scott Colburn, who has sadly passed away recently, uh, uh, the credit they were due. They were MUFON investigators and they lived in Nebraska. And their senator was Senator James Exxon. 
who was on the Senate Arms Committee. And so he, he was a very long-standing, well-respected senator. And because Ray Boucher and Scott Colburn were MUFON and they were interested in Rendlesham because it involved American personnel largely, they went to the Senator Exxon and said, uh, you know, there's this a case in the UK. It's involving US Air Force Security Police. Lots of people involved and, and they've seen some incredible stuff. Are you interested? And he went, no, I'm not really interested. They met him and they said, well, if we get you more evidence, will you get, you know, take an interest? And he said, well, if you get me more evidence, I will. So quite a long story short, they get him the memo, they get him the audio tape, and he's kind of interested. So he goes... Uh, Ray Boucher goes, do you know what? I'm going to ring Colonel Holt. So he gets hold of his number. He's at a different base. He calls him out in the blue. Colonel Holt is still in the US Air Force. This is not the public personality that you've come to know over the last 50 or 60 documentaries. He's still in the Air Force. He's a, he's a full bird colonel. He rings him up in April of 1985. And he says, Colonel, I am Ray Boucher. I'm a MUFON, Mutual UFO Network researcher in Vertigan Reynolds and Forest. Now, by that stage, Ray Boucher had actually talked to a number of uh, military witnesses, including Larry Warren and Sergeant Adrian Buston. And so he basically said, uh, right, I'm going to put out a scenario to you, and, and can you give me a, a, a comment on it? And he went, OK, I've talked to Larry Warren, I've talked to Adrian Bustinza and others. Uh, basically, what they're telling me is that there is a, a landing of a craft in a field, that it's been surrounded by US Air Force security police officers. It's been filmed on a video, motion picture cameras, and that the base commander, Colonel Gordon Williams, uh, in charge of 12,000 people, is there. And his response was, and he wrote it down verbatim, he says, yeah, I can verify all of that. I can substantiate all of that for the senator. And when I read that on his notes, his research notes that Ray Boucher had very kindly sent me, I nearly fell off my chair because there it is. And he wrote down verbatim. And let's just be clear to the sceptics who will be out there saying, no, you know, you know, you've got the wrong end of the stick. It was unambiguous. It wasn't unambiguous because... Go, go, through, I, them, go through them one by one again slowly because each one of them is super significant. The four things that he said, hey, can you confirm what are the things, the four things? Yeah. Are, I think. So, so, so what he'd admitted to that was written down verbatim, I can verify that. I can substantiate all of that for the senator, for Senator James Ecton, was that there'd been another landing, not the one in the Holt memo, that it was in a field that US Air Force security police officers were in a cordon around this craft, that it was being filmed on cameras with motion picture, not still photographs, moving image video, for what sense of a word, and that Colonel Williams, the guy in charge of the top strike base in the United Kingdom, in charge of 12,000 personnel, was present when all of this is being filmed. The guy who later leans against the car in Fox's... Who movie. says, ah, no, no aliens, no, that's all rubbish. But it but basically had to admit that there was the memo. And so, but putting it in the context, suddenly, James Exxon doesn't want to know Scott Colburn or Ray Boucher anymore. And so Ray Boucher keeps ringing up and he talks to his staffers and they say, no, he's busy, he's busy. And he, he basically never gets to see him again. And he keeps getting the, the push off and he writes letter after letter to Senator Exxon and they all get rejected and blah, blah, blah. Now, some of the letters that uh, Ray Boucher wrote were absolutely brilliant. And two of them are highlighted in, in the book uh, in full because they are like little pieces of documentary evidence. Because in some of the paragraphs, it lays it out, unambiguous. I rang up Colonel Holt on such and such a day. I asked him, I gave him this scenario, that there was a, a landing in a field, that it was being surrounded by security police, uh, that it was being filmed on motion picture footage, and that Colonel Williams was there. And you said this. And he'd wrote it down verbatim. So, if the, you know, if people had said it was unambiguous, it can't be, because he's reiterated so, so it completely. So, so that data is super important, and then absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah, but but here's it's a here's the find admission. Yeah, but here's the next level stuff that the book, your book, non-human takes us is 
and you have all the pieces in place and the knowledge and the background to explore this, is that where does this take us in terms of Adrian Bestenza undergoes this uh, enhanced interrogation, completely immoral, completely illegal. Two things I want to go with that. One, that is my lab, right? That is the beginning of my lab because these guys who show up, it's not their first rodeo. <laughs> so that is oh, no. super, super important to this whole thing. And that speaks to Williams leaning against the car. This is this is a fact when you want to say puts it to bed. This is a super important point that the book puts to bed that in 1980, they were all over this stuff. No one was particularly surprised. The guy with the camera was there. The whole thing was going. This is not their first rodeo. Speak to that. Absolutely. Uh, and here's an interesting development that came uh, from the book uh, and in a sense has come post release of the book. In the conclusions of the book, or in one of the chapters of the book, there is a chapter with an entirely new witness called James Stewart, who was not a security policeman. He was a US Air Force uh, crew chief. He basically repaired aircraft. Now, in the book, he said that he had this incredible sighting, which we can talk about, uh, but he had had this sighting in late December 1980. And he'd assumed that it was the Reynoldsham incident because... That was famous. However, after the book's release, literally within a week or so of the book's release, he rang me up and he said, I've been checking my personal records. Uh, actually, I left the base in December uh, in early uh, 1982. Uh, early 1980. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So I think it was February 1980. And so he said, my sighting, my event must have been December, late December 1979. Now, on the one hand, it takes it away from the late cluster of sightings in late December, but it then throws up all these new questions. Because if this guy is for real, and I checked his records, and, and he's bona fide who he is, really nice guy, no axe to grind, and I think he's a genuine uh, witness, but his event was December 1979. Well, if you now think that in late December a really significant UFO event happened in the forest and by the East Gate in 1979, it's why some people have thought, I wonder why cameras were there. Did they know? Were they in advanced knowledge that something was going to happen UFO-wise? And let's let's put this uh skeptical argument to bed some people have skept uh, uh, have theorized that it's a uh, a weapon uh it's a massive hysteria it was the lighthouse it was uh, uh some kind of new technology that would be uh reflected onto the sky in the conclusion of the book i break down all the incidents into different timed events and do you know how many incidents there are well you do because you've read the book 18, but taking away one, it, I said 18, then this James Stewart is taken out because it's a year earlier. But we're left with 17 different timed events, all involving nothing that can be described in any human terrestrial term. We're talking uh, beach ball sized glowing red objects, car sized beach ball, uh, uh, car sized glowing objects. We're talking about triangles. We're talking about uh, white spheres. You know, we're, we're talking structure. And we're also all... talking abduction. We're talking abduction. Uh, uh, absolutely. There's at least two uh, abduction elements uh, to the to the to the Reynolds from events. But what you've got to understand is that nobody ever broke it down in quite that way. And I go into a lot more sightings and discovered a lot more sightings. Steve Longero, this airman who I did the next cognitive interview with, he uh, went on to admit that he'd been inside the nuclear weapons storage area when he'd seen a UFO shine a beam down into the nuclear bunkers. And it was what was underground, not inside the bunkers, because in the bunkers, doors would open and it would go underground. The missiles would go, the weapons would go underground. And he said that, so this is first-hand testimony. We'd never had this before. We'd had rumours, but now we have a guy putting his name to it in a statement saying, I saw a beam coming down into the bunkers and it did this. 
and it did like a grid like search all the way down the hot row of bunkers, which is about 200 meters long. So he was doing some kind of scan, what is in there. All right. But what also emerged through his new testimony was that he'd literally been on shift a couple of days and he was walking around inside the weapon storage area with an experienced airman or sergeant. He couldn't quite remember who it was. Somebody experienced, which wasn't the case, showed him what to do, how it worked inside the weapon storage area. Well, he said, well, when the UFO went off, over the, off the, uh, turned its beam off and then went out, it headed towards Reynoldsham Forest, towards the East Gate in Reynoldsham Forest. And he could hear people over the radio following it. And as soon as it went in the forest, then people, there was like an order given that we want as many security police into the forest because we don't know what we're dealing with. That would be the inference. And so because he was supernumerary and it wouldn't happen ordinarily, he was taken from the site and told to get in a truck and off he went to the forest. Well, when he goes to the forest, he goes to the staging area, the area where they can't go any further, so they leave the vehicle. He's then with a group of 10 or 15 others who are all thinking, what the hell's going on? And they're taken to what was described as the first night landing, the depressions in the ground, the triangle depressions. But guess what? While he's there, they have a UFO sight in themselves. Nobody had ever heard of that. So this is brand new information. Now, all that happens is that the likes of Colonel Holt just dismisses it all. Uh, Penniston, I'm I'm involved in in a hoax. I'm I'm deceiving everybody by making a hoax documentary because I'm being involved in a documentary called Capital Green that's in post-production. Why would I? Why would I uh, put all these years into research just to shoot myself in the foot uh, and, and, and hoax the public? That's not what I'm about at all. I'm trying to get the truth out. And what becomes clear is uh, as clear as mud as we would say in the uk is that there is a complete narrative control by four people and that is wrong and i guarantee well, it's a, hell, a hell of a lot more than four people get get back to that put that point though uh, because you 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 kind of pull back a little bit when i ask that and i can understand why but it is it is scary to think about adrian in that room oh absolutely it's, but he wasn't the only one Larry Warren. No, no, no. He's not the only one. But but we're not, you know, this is like Abu Gray. Abu Gray is on is on kind of one end, and then we got this. But this guy is all the stuff that we heard. Because right now we got guys standing up there and saying, Mamby Pamby, you know, disclosure, and yeah, we might have done this, we might have done that. Own this. Own what you did to Adrian. Own PTSD for life. Own screwed it. it it not only screwed him up, but I also want you to speak to, it doesn't just go back to 1979. We can only assume that this goes back to at least 1946, right? So they have all the pieces in place. They're investigating these things all the time. They have a very systematic organ. We can only assume the burden of proof is on them now to, with this book, with non-human, it further shifts the burden of proof in a lot of these areas to say, okay, I'm glad you're coming forward, but now tell us, explain to us what happened. Explain to us what happened to the testimony that Adrian gave. What did you do with it? Where did it go? What other, go ahead. Absolutely. Adrian, Adrian Bustin's, uh, uh, all the interviews should have been recorded. Uh, The statements should have been the notes that were taken. Adrian Bustin's said, I gave a three page statement, but I I never saw it again. I asked for a copy. I never got it. Where is that? Uh, audio interviews were regularly done by uh, Office of uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigation. Where are all that? Now, one of the incredible things that has come out in the book, and I've not really talked about it that much because there is so much to talk about, but it's an incredibly important little piece of information that has huge implications, is during the course of my research, I spoke to three US Air Force security policemen who said that all of the... Th- the main radio channels that the US Air Force Security Police used, Central Security Control, the Weapon Storage Area, and um, the more like mobile patrols, they were you routinely recorded on audio tape. Now that means there is no ambiguity there. There was all the evidence for all the nights. We wouldn't have to start piecing it together. 
But nobody talks about that. Colonel Holt certainly never talks about that. Colonel Williams certainly never talks about that. But three airmen, low, lower ranks, have said, yeah, it was routinely recorded. So where did all that information go? And one other thing here, when we talk, going back to Colonel Holt, Colonel Holt, uh, we now have this classic edited, well, classic audio tape that's 18 minutes long that's in the public domain. However, he has told two people that I know, Harry Harris, a Manchester solicitor, and also Georgina Brunei, who was the author of You Can't Tell the People in 2000, that he had over five hours of audio. Now, why is Georgina Brunei going to make that up? and go public with it. Why would she do that? Why would she lie? She's not going to do that. But according to him, no, no, I never said that to Harry Harris. No, I never said that to uh, Georgina Bruna. And sadly, both of them are, are not with us anymore. So here's the know, big question. There's, there's, there's something going on. Right, right. And, and here's the big question. And we could speak for hours and we would definitely have to talk again. And I want to do everything I can to help you. Uh, I'll definitely try my best to help you with publishers because I, I talked to him. I definitely try my best to, to help you with uh, doing a Kindle version as soon as you can. And I'd love to help fund, to help you get that, get an audible version out. Again, I'd like to just give a grant to your work because this is, I sincerely believe all, this all is I important. Want, all... But hold on, let, let, but let me finish this, this question because I, I don't want to run out of time, your time or my time. So- you know, Gary, what we're really trying to figure out, I mean, the ethos of this show is inquiry to perpetuate doubt, but it's also who are we, why are we here? That's why I'm interested in ET. I'm not interested in ET because nuts and bolts are technology. I want to know who I am, why I'm here. And where did we come from? Where did we come from? And where where are we going to, you know, because we'll talk about the, what they what they've delivered and the, the 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 messages that come through and the download and the binary code and all this. But part of that equation that you are in a unique position to really give us insights into is, again, back to Williams leaning on that car and back to the disinformation and the misinformation. How much do these guys know? We know that UFO is in control. ET is in control. ET decides that. But to what extent does your gut tell you that on one hand, they may just be scrambling in the dark, you know, I mean, just completely lost in doing this. On the other hand, they may be, as has been speculated for a long time, partners in, with one of the groups, one of the species with a certain agenda in doing that. What does your gut tell you is the information game that's really going on behind this? How much do they really know, do you think? In terms of the Americans who have controlled the subject literally around the world, uh, since Roswell, certainly since then, if not before. Um, I think that whilst we may be on the brink of disclosure in terms of an admission that we're dealing with something non-human, that's possible, a real possibility with the David Grush uh, revelations. Uh, now, I personally think that a month after his uh, comments, uh, nobody's laid a finger on him. So I tend to think that he is who he says he is. And that if congressional hearings happen and he takes part and other people who are first-hand witnesses involved in reverse engineering projects come on the record, then that might be a game changer. And the media, which are still not take, playing ball at the moment, you, will have you don't, to. You don't think he's counterintelligence? I mean, you don't. Lou Elizondo has been outed over the last year at counterintelligence, playing the game the whole time. He is Richard Doty 2.0. You don't think this is Richard Doty 3.0? Why at this point counterintelligence? Isn't it a, a manufactured? Are they, they're carrying some agenda for somebody? Uh, oh, I, what do they really? What do they really know? Do they really know this stuff, or are they just? doing the best they can with very, very limited information. My take on this, based on my evidential background, is that there is some agenda at play that we're not aware of, that there is something driving this uh, current set of developments over the last two years, especially with the changes in legislation in the Congress, etc. It does very much look like, I think, there is some event that's happened UFO-wise, intelligence-wise, there's some event that we're not aware of that is driving the speed of what's happening now. I have personally always felt 
that uh, after 2017, that there was an attempt by the intelligence community to rewrite history in the sense of America doesn't come out of it very well. They have created the stigma that went with the Robertson panel for January 1953. Everything was debunked. It worked incredibly well. So everybody living after 1950, born after 1953, has lived in a world of debunking. So that's without a shadow of doubt. People have died, committed suicide because they've been uh, lost their jobs, lost their homes, because they've admitted they've seen something. The ter 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 terrible ramifications. However, my personal thought is that after 2017, there seemed to be an agenda to rewrite history uh, where America get off the hook a bit as to their real relevance in this story. They have controlled this since the 1940s. At every major UFO event around the world, they have turned up recovered with retrieval teams. I think without a shadow of a doubt, uh, Roswell was real. There was a craft, there were bodies, probably, but there was at least a craft. And we have done our very best, or the Americans have done their best, to put this out to engineering and said, so try to make that piece work. And there has been some level of success. However, it may be tiny, tiny, and literally we know less than 1% of how something works. But it's still so advanced that it's still big for us. But this has all been done without Senate, Congress oversight, which is illegal, in my opinion. And I think they're trying to get this story out now just to say, look, technology is changing at a pace. One of the things that I thought for the last seven or eight years is that technology is developing at such a pace that the likes of sensors on aircraft, on ships, on radar, are picking up things that they didn't pick up before. So there's now tons of uh, data that can be analysed by scientists. So scientists who clamour for that data and repeatable data, uh, repeatable experience, they're going to have a wealth of all that now if it's released. And they are starting to get some of it. But there's something driving this. And I think that there is something else going on that is driving the agenda that says we are very close to a breakthrough. All I can say from my point of view, I've been followed the subject since I was 16, at the, uh, when I had my childhood sight in at the age of 16. I'm now 63. That's 47 years of following the subject that this feels like the closest in my lifetime that we are to some kind of breakthrough event. Quite how it will transpire and quite to what level, I don't know. But I think something is driving the Americans to get this out there, that there is some interaction with a non-human intelligence, and hence why my book is important. But it will not be important unless people get to know about it, and I will never have the publicity, machinery, like a publishing house can do. But I want to find a publishing house and say, look, this needs to be out there because people are in for a shock and this book will help them come to terms. Uh, as vice president of the of ICE, the International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research, our remit is preparing for contact. You know, uh, we, we've got a, a San Marino initiative that uh, hopefully will go to the UN either late this uh, year or early next year, we'll go to the United Nations. The first time since 1978. We are talking about a global issue this is a human uh, species issue and this is where we've got to get away from my country is better than your country we're more important than you we have to start speaking as one humanity oh no 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 don't go there we can't we can't go there we did uh, actually we can go there you want to go there go there but you have to go there in the context of non-human because i have I'm to tell you it. hold on hold on but, you don't understand exactly what i'm saying Everything about this book tells me all the reasons we can't go there. We won't go there. It scares the hell out of us to go there. And it would it would take a complete paradigm change is too overused, a huge cultural revolution in order for us to go there. I, 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 and I want to spin that into a question. You mentioned intelligence and I think intelligence as an intelligence uh, apparatus and we always use that uh, singular, and I think it needs to be plural. And you're the right guy. You've been in the military, and you've been in policing, and you've rubbed shoulders. How many different intelligence agendas 
do you think might be out there? Because from the people like me who sit on the sidelines and just casually research it, it certainly seems like there's multiple agendas within these intelligence communities. And they seem to be at odds at various times in terms of who's going to push this, who's going to push that. What does your gut tell you in terms of what are the implications for that and who are they teamed up on? Because at some level, this goes much bigger. The global thing has already been done, whether it's yeah, so it, I'll leave it there. Well, in the time that we've got left, what I'll say, what I'll say is that we're talking if 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 the basic premise, and I believe this is a basic premise, that Roswell was real and that we recovered some craft from elsewhere, and that there it, it proved that there was life out there, uh, which I believe, then if somebody's got here and there were bodies, then we've had that information i think logically we would all try to retrieve the the machinery and try to make it work and the country that made it work would become the most powerful nation on earth some people would say that's the united states and why they've been so powerful however so my basic role is i've always believed from my own childhood side that there was life out there i had no prior interest but then after that it's lit a catalyst in me that then came to full uh, fruition by becoming a researcher in January 2002 when I went public with my database. So I'm now 21 years into my public research, but it stayed with me. I do believe that uh, we're dealing with something that's probably extraterrestrial, but the more I've got to know about the subject, I now believe we're dealing with non-human intelligence. It may be ultra-terrestrial, it may be interdimensional, uh, it may be a combination of all three, but based on the abduction phenomena, of which I do believe is real, and that most people are sincere, that, and what particularly proves that to me is that even in the third world, people without access to media come out with virtually identical stories of being examined and taken aboard, missing time, and whatever. So that says to me something is, is, is happening there real, and based on the abduction, of, there are commonality of species that are seen, seemingly. Now, I have no direct evidence to say that that's real, but there's a, num a preponderance of evidence all around the world, different cultures, to say that something broadly similar is happening on each continent. So it says to me that almost certainly there are uh, extraterrestrial intelligences coming here, but in recent years, and when you look at things like Skinwalker and things like that and other portals and it, I never used to believe any of that kind of thing, but I think over time, with the result of quantum uh, mechanics, that they're saying, look, there are other dimensions, and there may well be parallel worlds. And so you've just got to have an open mind. Uh, now, in more recent years, certain people have said there may well be some very old uh, inhabitant of the Earth that has, uh, whether it lives in the oceans or wherever. It, they don't interact, but they've been here a long time. I think that's entirely possible. When you go back to the ancient alien stuff, I kind of believe all that because the petroglyphs all over the world and all the many cultures, it's the sky gods. If you replace sky gods with alien, it makes more sense. When you, you know, biblical, when you think of all the incidents in the biblical, people come down in chariots and, you know, Ezekiel and all that kind of stuff, it makes more sense to replace God with alien. Uh, and I think people did not know how to interpret it, uh, what they were witnessing in those days. But I think we do now. And so I think it's a combination of all those things. But I think personally that we are dealing with uh, non human intelligence. And that's why I called it that. I didn't say it was ET, I'm saying it's a combination but it's certainly not human, and that's what the book is telling. And the 17 incidents in the conclusion, all time different, different people, they are saying that this was not any kind of an exercise duped on the, the poor American servicemen. We didn't have the technology in those days to do these kind of things and reflect things and whatever. Uh, it, it, ridiculous. Uh, they saw different things, and, and, and they uh, more a lot of them were really screwed up a lot of them were physically injured and have needed help uh, medically. And we just don't talk about it. And I'm, I, I kind of did the book for the other people to say, look, there are still a lot of people I think out there who've never gone on the record, but they're still alive at the moment. But as time goes on, they're going to pass away. We need to capture that testimony. And the book is there to say, look, the narrative is wrong. TV is wrong. Uh, 
But unless I can reach the right audience, only a few people are going to know that I'm out there and wrote this book because these people aren't going to tell you about the book. Let, let me uh, let me ask the same question in a different way, and that is, what role do you think we have to play in disclosure as you outline? Because again, let me frame this up. What what I read non-human, it confirms for me that I absolutely cannot trust my government in any way, shape. Oh, absolutely. Form. And that Lou Elizondo, I bought Lou Elizondo, you know, shit, I did, just like everybody else for a year. And then he was outed as uh, Intel, you know, running an Intel program. Steve, Doty. Tony, you know, his lie was even his lie was even bigger. He runs that game, that horrible, horrible game. And then he says, well, it wasn't even about a E.T. It was about the stealth. And then years later, we find out, of course, it was about E.T. So this latest round is just the same thing. I don't see how anyone could could really cozy up to intelligence and assume that they're going to tell us anything. So then I guess the question is, what can we do? Because I think a lot of people rightfully say we really have to do something radically different in terms of how we approach this, in terms of how we collectively organize, how we make contact or make ourselves. What is the, I forgot the slogan that you said, prepare for contact. Yeah. But for God's sake, let's not talk about intelligence agencies as, as playing. You know, it's like the old expression. Governments should fear their people. People should not fear their their governments. And we're in the opposite situation. And we've just gone through the last three, three years where they've given us the warm-up exercise for how they can lock everything down, run everything. And it's hard not to assume that this yep. latest disclosure isn't playing a lot of those same notes over and over again in terms of you think, you think, you think that was bad? You watch what we can do in terms of controlling. In a terms, because we have to, we have to control it. Look at how big this thing is. Well, they're doing a very good job uh, of the mainstream media at the moment because they're still not giving it attention. Uh, but I have a thoughts on that, uh, and I guess we're going to have to wait and see. But I can't see how the momentum that is building up at the moment uh, there is. It does feel like something is happening momentum wise, and Tim Burchett. Is, is confirmed that there is going to be some kind of a congressional hearing with witnesses by the end of July. So they've squeezed that in. Quite what it'll entail, whether, it, I mean, the first two congressional hearings were a real downbeat, poor affair. And what it showed was that uh, basically the Pentagon don't want this to come out. RO is not the office to bring the information out to the public. They are, I think, not wanting this to come out. But I think... The fact that Grush's credentials are so good, if you think about that he was able to brief the president you know, up to that level, he's got a higher classification than all the people in, in Arrow, so why would Arrow know? They're not at the right level. If he really did give, give uh, testimony for 11 hours, as reported, then uh, he must be pretty good because after 10 minutes, uh, the inspector general is going to go, you're full of shit, out of here. So the fact that he's done that, and a month later, nobody's laid a glove on him yet. And apparently, uh, in the woodwork, uh, the likes of Rubio, Senator Rubio, has said that first-hand witness testimonies have come forward to back his claims. Now, that's where the sceptical argument was, ah, oh, well, he's only a hearsay. Yeah, but he's hearsay that said, that's the program, it's called this, it's run by him, it's based there. Now, if he's done that for 11 hours, that's pretty good. And if then people have said, well, I was in the holding that program and it is based there and I have directly had uh, involvement in reverse engineering, which is entirely possible based on what people are saying, then there's a real problem. And I think the Pentagon don't want this to come out. They want to control it and are still fighting. And I think this stems back to the 1950s. There's always been the elements within the military who say this should be given to the people. We should tell the truth. And then there's the others who fall behind the intelligence community that have basically hijacked governments and said, we're in control, really. We make the decisions, really. You'll do what we say. Uh, and I think there's been this you know, infighting for donkey's years. But I do think now there appears to be a possible mechanism for something to happen. Quite what it will be, quite what, I don't know. But if 
let's just imagine a scenario that says it does happen. I think that at the point that uh, Grush is backed up by first and high level military uh, officials, uh, government officials who say, I've had direct working involvement, people are not going to be satisfied with that. They're going to say, all right, that's pretty good, but we want to see the proof. The only way you're going to convict, uh, uh, convince 95% of the world who thinks it's bullshit is some kind of proof. Now, we, we, we've heard this talk of a 23-minute video taken by a, a pilot uh, in clear daylight, and, the, and there's an object sat right next to his plane for 23 minutes. The, Tim Birchett, Senator Birchett, talks about that. Well, I think that's what needs to come out to say, look, this ain't Russian, this ain't China. We're dealing with something that comes from elsewhere, wherever that elsewhere is. And I think that could happen. But I also think that, and I've said for many years, that at the moment, there are a number of bricks coming out of a dam. And the water pressure is building on the central point of the dam. And it's getting bigger and bigger as more bricks come out. But at some point, there'll be a critical mass. The dam will bust. And then you're into disclosure. And it'll be 24-7. Every news channel, like a terrorist incident, like uh, COVID kind of thing, uh, it'll be news all the time. And then you're into a new paradigm. Then there's going to be a lot of public anger. Then there's going to be a lot of media anger because most of the media have been uh, duplicitous in covering this up at the highest level, but not at the ordinary level. Most people are good people. But I think there'll be a huge backlash if it turned out that, Indeed, ET was real and has been here for a long time. And the Americans covered it up. There's going to be a huge backlash against the American people, the Ameri uh, against the military, governments, and also uh, the uh, the media. How do you deal with that? Well, to me, I've always thought of South Africa and the apartheid regime. You should have uh, uh, truth and reconciliation hearings uh, as a way of just saying, look, I was involved in that program. I couldn't talk about it. Yes, we were dealing with this. I lied. I was a disinformation expert. Put him on the stand and say, thanks for your testimony. Right, okay, you've given your piece. Go on. We don't send you to prison. We're not out there to shoot people. But just admit your part in this story. And let's get the story out there. Because it's the biggest story, if real, for humanity. It's the, everybody will say that as and when and if, uh, contact with the non-human intelligences acknowledge universally that it will be the most profound moment in human history. So we're on, it seems like we're on the brink of something. I hope I'm right. I hope I'm not dreaming this up, but it does appear that there's momentum and there's a, a mechanism to make it maybe make the breakthrough and the mainstream will only get, take it serious at congressional hearings when first-hand witnesses like Robert Salas will go on, because I think there'll be lots of hearings, and Robert Salas will say, yeah, I was in a missile bunker 60, 80 feet underground and then 10 missiles were shut down. The American public have never heard this unless you go to a UFO documentary. 95% of the world thinks it's rubbish. This is the biggest cover-up, I think, in history. The whole of the last 7,500 years, all the history books will need to be rewritten if this is true. And there needs to be a mechanism to deal with the anger that will come from it. Because people have been lied to all their lives. People have lost jobs. People have been ridiculed. Uh, some, you know, people have taken lives and whatever. So that's where we're at. Whether it'll happen, I don't know. I hope it does. Because whatever happens, I think the public have a right to know if there is that content. Absolutely love the optimism. Wish I could share it with you, but I certainly I'm an optimist. It, I, I hope it comes out that way. I hope we can turn back the clock to days when that is possible, and maybe we can. You make it. You make a good case. I, I I I think that when Eisenhower gave his speech about the military-industrial complex, he said we must guard against the military-industrial complex, and I think he was probably the last president. Uh, to have any real handle on the intelligence community. And at that point there, he was maybe giving you an inkling that we'd lost to the intelligence community. So that that's, I guess, for a lot of folks, that's where the optimism wanes a little bit is like they've had, they've had the reins for a while. Hey, this again is uh, fantastic. Gary, thank you so much for, for doing Welcome. this. The book that you're going to want to check out, Non-Human, The Rendlesham Forest UFO Incidents, 
17 of them, you will be blown away. And uh, we got to make sure that we support Gary in any way we can to get this book out as much as much as possible. It's a really is going to be paradigm shattering for a lot of people and especially folks who know a little bit about the case because that grounding is fundamental or if you thought you knew the case forget it you don't perfect way of putting it gary thanks again you're welcome thank you very much anytime thanks again to gary for joining me today on skeptico the one question i tee up from this interview I think has to do with the part at the end where we kind of disagreed. I mean, he's just over optimistic about the chances that these people who, as he reveals, have controlled, twisted, manipulated, leveraged in every extent this information that he reveals in the book that they would now somehow come clean or that to whatever extent they're going to come clean, it wouldn't be part of some agenda that isn't being revealed to us. So, I'd like your opinion on that. I think you got mine, so let's hear what you think. All right, I guess that will do it for this one. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.